God bless you. It's, it's Mother's Day. So uh, thank you for joining in on Mother's Day. And this is the third part of a teaching talking about suffering versus prosperity. And what, as Christians, what is the scripture teaching us about these things? Let me say right off the top that not all suffering is godly suffering, okay? That if you drink too much and you have a hangover, <laughs> you're not suffering for Christ. You're not suffering for God. If, if your suffering is because you're sinning and doing things against the will of God, that's just suffering. <laughs> And so what we want to talk about is when and why and where and who suffers and why do they suffer and how do we accept that? What is the goal? And I want to encourage everyone that whenever there is something in your life that you don't, like let's say you're not very peaceful you can go to one of many websites and just type in the word peace and just start reading the scriptures about peace. And the Lord will teach you and show you and enlighten you about how you can become more peaceful. And that's really all I did with this suffering, trying to understand why I suffered why I continued to suffer and why I didn't get the deliverance that I thought I should have gotten or whatever. One thing that I learned through what I went through is I have a lot more compassion for people that are going through things. And I'm almost ashamed of myself that I ever bought into this thing that, well, if you just had more faith, and oh, you must be outside the will of God if you're sick, or if, you know, there are genetic problems, and there are things that happen in life that cause people to go through anguish and misery. And for me to add shame and guilt to someone else, because I don't think that they're spiritual enough that, that was just wrong. That was sin in my life. And I should have known better. And I'm glad that I was able to go through what I went through because I have learned that compassion for others. And I've seen that this whole doctrine, that if you believe in Jesus, he's just going to bless you with everything. And you're going to be blessed in every facet of your life. Well, certainly that is God's primary will. But we also know that Adam and Eve, when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that there were curses that came upon them. The man by the sweat of his brow, he was going to have to you know, farm the land and thorns and thistles, and the woman would have uh, labor and uh, men would rule over them. All of these things have come true, and they didn't end when Christ was resurrected. They will not end until Christ comes back and restores the earth in the millennial kingdom. And getting that through my mind was, it was liberating to understand and not have any more shame and guilt when I don't feel good or when things bad happen to me. It's not because I'm out of fellowship. It's not because I need to renew my mind. It's not because I don't have enough faith. It's because we live in a present evil world that groans in travail, waiting for the redemption of the sons of God. And that's going to continue to happen. Okay? There's a lot of wisdom in the Bible that will help you learn how to eat better and to take better care of your body and those kinds of things so that you can be healthier. I'm not poo-pooing any of that, nor is there having faith in God that can help you spiritually. However, 
as we will see in the scriptures, sometimes bad things happen to good people and sometimes God wants it. He doesn't cause it, but he wants it. It is his will. And I would never, two years ago, I would never have believed that God's will would be that someone endure hardship. But as I thought about it more and more, I thought, why in the world did I ever think that? As a parent, I made my kids go through hardship. I don't care if you don't want to clean up your toys, you're going to clean up your toys. I don't care if you don't want to brush your teeth, you need to brush your teeth. Now, those may not seem like hardships to you, but to a three year old, the world is coming to an end because they have to go to bed now, right? They have to put away their toys. Teaching my son how to mow the grass, teaching them how to do the laundry, teaching, you know, all of those things, you, you, you want to teach your kids that. I've always thought these people who say, well, I don't want my kids to have it as hard as I did. Why not? I want my kids to work hard. I want them to learn what it is to go through tough times so that when they have to go through tough times, they're ready for it. I don't want them to be soft, mamby-pamby kids who every time something bad happens, they shrink and they curl up in the fetal position. I want them to be tough. I talked about boxing last week. The reason Muhammad Ali was such a great boxer Part of it was because, you know, he had good hand-eye coordination and good feet work and all that stuff. But it was also because he could take a punch like nobody I've ever seen. That man got hit time after time after time after time, and you couldn't knock him out. And we as Christians, we're going to take blows from the adversary. Bad things are going to happen to us. We need to learn how to take a punch. And that doesn't happen if we shrink all the time. If we think, well, if I, if I speak the gospel, they'll think I'm a Jesus freak. They won't like me. So what? Get out there and boldly speak God's word and don't care what people think about you. And in fact, what we're going to see from the scriptures is that's one of the ways you know you're doing it right, is if the world doesn't like you. And if they tell you to shut up and they threaten you with jail or harm, you know you're doing it right. I watched a fascinating video of these people freaking out about Muslims stoning some Christians in Dearborn, Michigan. What I learned was these Christians were being jerks. They weren't suffering righteously. They wore t-shirts and carried signs basically that said, if you're a Muslim, you're going to hell. It's not the gospel message. That's not the message of peace and love that Jesus wants to bring to us. But these people wanted to complain and talk to the police that these Muslims got mad at them at this festival because they went around being belligerent to them. Okay? So there's some wisdom in speaking the gospel. We want, and we're going to see that as we get into the word. We want to love people. We want to bring them to Christ. We don't want to threaten them. I mean, they, there may be a place where the Lord puts it in your heart in a specific, you know, a message of prophecy to someone who is evil, right? To, to confront them, but just to walk around in people's faces, being mean to them, saying ugly things to them, that's just not God's word. It's, it's just not the message that Christ wanted to convey. So I would like you to all go to uh, the REV online so that you can read along with me. There it is. <clears throat> and we're going to start in Romans chapter 5. And this verse, this section of verses here are very powerful stuff. And it's a sandwich, and you'll see it as we read it. 
in Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by trust, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained access by trust into this grace in which we stand. And so let us boast in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but let us also boast in our hardships. In some translations say suffering. And it's, I like hardships, but suffering is good as well. Things that we put up with, things that happen bad to us, we want to boast in those. And that doesn't make any sense at first blush, but let's keep reading here. Knowing that hardship produces endurance. And, and that's it. You look at the greatest athletes who ever achieve anything, it's because they endured hardship. When their legs burned, because they've been running all day, because their bodies hurt, because their muscles hurt, because they got tired in their minds and they pushed through it, they were able to become champions. And we, it makes, it, it, this is a perfect analogy that as we endure things, because God tells us to put on our armor, we're in a battle with the devil and what he's trying to do to us and to others around us. We have to be ready and willing to take blows like we would in battle or like we would in an athletic contest. That the other team's going to score sometimes. The other team's going to knock us down sometimes. How do we respond? That's what putting up with hardships does and boasting in them. Yay, God, I'm doing it right. <laughs> Because if you, if, if you never put yourself out there and speak the word, if you never challenge someone else's beliefs, if you never attack the devil, well, nothing bad's going to happen to you, not in a spiritual sense. But if you're out there trying to further the gospel, to further God's kingdom, the devil's not going to like you. And he is going to array people against you. And guess what? And so we, yay, I got beat up today. <laughs> I got thrown in jail for speaking the gospel. Hooray. And that's just such a foreign thing to our mind, to everything that, we, but when you think about it in other ways of life, it's, if you start your own business, it doesn't automatically go from zero dollars to a billion dollars overnight. You might have to struggle for a year or two to get the thing going right. You go through those hardships. You learn how to eat box macaroni and cheese and peanut butter sandwiches, right? You don't start out with a Rolls Royce. You might start out with an old beat up pickup truck to drive. You know, you go through those hardships in everything else. Doesn't it make sense that spiritually we're going to, in this life, we're going to grow? But unfortunately, at least for me, I was taught that once you believe in Jesus, everything is going to work out good for you. And, and that's just not so. And the scripture tells us it's not so. And sometimes God wants us to learn by going through some hardships. He wants us to experience difficulty so that we can learn how to overcome it. One big reason is so that we can help others go through it. If I don't know how to go through it, I'm not going to be able to help anybody else go through it, right? So one thing is that endurance, and then what's the next thing? Uh, oops. So hardship produces endurance, and endurance, character. And this is a great word. I love the way that Shane Hyde translates this character. It's what you're made of. Uh, somebody said that character is what you do when no one's looking. It's how your ethics and morals exist when there's nobody there to tell you you don't have to or you do have to. And finally, character, hope. And hope 
does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that was given to us. And I can tell you from my own experience that my hope in the return of Christ has been strengthened and made more real through the hardships that I experienced. I know beyond a shadow, no one could convince me that Jesus Christ isn't coming back. I, I know him. I, I, I leaned on him so heavily for so long. His, his reality is greater than my reality even right now even the, the physical that I see around me, the hope of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is more real to me than that. And going through tough times and having your faith established will make that happen for you. It, it, and the, <laughs> you can't get through it until you go through it. And so there's no way that I, I can't put it in a test tube and so, say, see, here it is. You do this and then this. But I guarantee you, it will happen as you endure and, and boast in your hardships. You will get this endurance and then that will build character. And then that hope will be so great. It, it will be what you live for. Verse six. I love this. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died in place of the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous person one will die, though for a good person perhaps someone would even be brave enough to die. But God shows his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died in our place. That is so incredible. He didn't die for us once we got our act together and once we started doing good. He died for us so that we could get better, so that we could do good when we were still in the depths of our depravity. Now, here's the sandwich. Verse 9, since we now have been declared righteous by his blood. Remember, that was the first thing in verse 1, that we've been declared righteous by faith or trust. His blood is why God was able to declare us righteous. Much more surely then we will be saved from the wrath through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also continue to boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So that section begins with that we've been declared by trust, so let's boast. And then it ends with we've been declared righteous, so let's continue boasting. See that? And we boast because we've been saved. We boast because he has said, Michelle, you're righteous. Not because you did anything, but because Christ did it for you. Eric, you are righteous. You're declared righteous. God raised your hand, and the winner is Eric and Melinda and their whole household because of what Jesus Christ did. You are declared righteous. So let's, let's boast in whatever it is that we do for God. Let's boast in God that what he's done for us has set us free no matter what happens to us. Good, bad, indifferent, let's boast in God. Go to 1 Peter. Here's a man who knew something about boasting in <laughs> his trials, his tribulations, his hardships. The apostle Peter and of the apostles, he's definitely the one that I relate to the most. He had a big mouth. He was a braggart. He would say he was going to do something and then fall flat on his face. <laughs> I'm like, Peter, I can't wait to I can't wait to meet Peter. He was just out there. He was just willing to to go and just messed up all the time and 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 just made huge mistakes. 
but he kept getting back up. And that's what we want to do is keep getting back up. First Peter chapter three, and we'll start in verse eight. Finally, all of you be like-minded, compassionate, having brotherly affection, tender-hearted, humble-minded. Do not repay evil for evil or verbal abuse for verbal abuse. And brothers and sisters, this is the toughest one for me is to not come back at somebody and learn how to boast in my suffering. Man, this guy called me every name in the book and I didn't say anything back to him. <laughs> I want that to happen someday. <laughs> uh, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called so that you inherit a blessing. When we do these things, we will be rewarded for all eternity. Wow. Verse 10, for whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech, and he must turn away from evil and do good. He must seek peace and diligently pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears attend to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Verse 13, and who will harm you if you are zealots for that which is good? And this is a rhetorical question. There's a lot of people that will harm you if you're zealots for that which is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of them, neither be troubled. Remember we, Jesus we were reading in the gospels in John 14 and 15, Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled when they persecute you. Verse 15, but in your hearts, set the Lord Christ apart as holy and always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Think about this in the context of suffering. Why are you so happy about Jesus when you're suffering. Be ready to give an answer for why that is true. Verse 16, yet do it with meekness and respect, having a good conscience, so that in whatever thing you are spoken against, those who revile you, revile your good way of life in Christ will be put to shame. They'll have to answer to God for being mean to you when you were doing good, okay? And this is what I was talking about with those Christians who wore those, if you're a Muslim, you're going to hell. That's not what we want to, right? It says, but do it with meekness and respect, having a good conscience. We're not going around insulting people to get them to love Christ. We are loving them and showing them the love of Christ. Verse 17. And this is powerful. When I read this the first time, I had to stop what I was doing and go over this in my mind several times so that I could understand it. For it is better to suffer for doing good if the will of God should will it than for doing evil. Sometimes it's God's will that we go through stuff. Just like as parents, we have our children go through stuff because they need to learn how to, they're not going to be good adults if every time something bad happens to them, they just curl up in a ball. We want them to get stronger. We want them to learn how to endure. For Christ also suffered for sins once, the righteous for the unrighteous. He set the example for us. He suffered for us even though we were unrighteous. We need to suffer for other people even though they're unrighteous. That's what it is to be Christ-like, or that's one of the ways that it is to be Christ-like, is to suffer in dignity, is to suffer when you don't deserve it. In order to bring us to God, that's why we do it, is to help people come to God. That's God's primary will, that people get saved. 
And so sometimes he will want you to go through something in order to help someone come to him. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which state also he went and heralded his victory to the spirits in prison who at one time were disobedient when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark. Let me stop real quick. Jesus went and witnessed to the devil spirits who caused the calamity that caused the flood, that Nephilim and all of that stuff. Won't it be great after living your life being kicked around and, and abused by the devil to be able to stand and witness in their face? You killed me, you hurt me, you did all of these things, but now, I'm standing with the Lord Jesus Christ and you will burn. We will do away with you forever. What a glorious day. We will get to stand. The more you do and the more you go through stuff and the more you that, you may get to toss a couple of them in there yourself. <laughs> Man, this is so powerful. But oh. Uh, when the patience of God waited in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, 120 years. Look how long God waited. Look how long suffering God was watching these evil spirits destroy his beautiful creation. In which a few, that is eight souls, were brought safely through water, which is symbolic of the baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh but an appeal to God for a good conscience. We were baptized into Christ's death so that we might have this good conscience, so that we might be able to do good through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who, having gone into heaven, is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers having been put in subjection to him. Wow. And we'll get to rule with Christ. We will reign with him. Chapter 4, 1 Peter. Start in verse 12. <clears throat> Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is occurring among you to tempt you as if a strange thing was happening to you. Okay? The devil is going to put you through a fiery trial to try to tempt you, to get you to do evil, to get you to reject God. Verse 13, on the contrary, to the extent you are sharing in the suffering of Christ, rejoice so that when his glory is revealed, you will rejoice with great joy. You'll know him. He'll know you. Huh. Your brothers in arms, you suffered together because he will never leave you. He will always be right there with you. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests on you. This is the proof that you are in union with Christ. If you're suffering, <laughs> I never saw this. I never let it feel. I thought that goodness was the proof that you were in union with Christ. And it is in, in depending on what's going on in your life, but also suffering, also enduring hardship is the proof that the spirit is working powerfully in you. Verse 15, for let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, as a meddler in other persons matters. But if a person suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. <clears throat> Sorry, but let him glorify God in this name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the house of God. God's going to judge his people first. Praise God, we've already been declared righteous, okay? And if it begins first at us, what will be the end of those who don't obey the good news? Look, I may not like certain people. 
I may not like the way that they've treated me, but I don't want them to be destroyed. <clears throat> if I can do something to help somebody get past the evil in their life, I want to do it just like Jesus did. Man, this stuff is so big. This is what it is to be a Christian. Whew. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify in this name, for it's time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins first at us, what will be the end of those who don't obey the good news? Think about that. I don't want to see people thrown into the lake of fire, but they will. I want to prevent it if I can. If it means I got to suffer for a little bit, that's better than watching them suffer eternal death. Verse 18. <clears throat> and if the righteous person is saved with difficulty, what will become of the ungodly person and sinner? So then, let those who suffer in accordance with the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. I mean, this, this, it, I would beseech you to read this over and over again and let it meditate upon it, recite it, make it a part of you so that when bad stuff happens, you're ready for it and you know why you're doing it. Okay. We don't seek out suffering. Okay. It's not that I want to go out and suffer. But if God's will is for me to do it, it's for a good reason. It's because he's trying to save somebody. Just like when Christ suffered for us, it was to save us. And sometimes God may ask you to suffer to save someone. What a what an awesome responsibility and privilege that we are fellow workers with God and with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're helping save people. <laughs> wow. It's so much bigger than anything. I, I This stuff is just, it's alive, and you see it every day if you're doing your best to live it. Man. Go to Hebrews. We'll close here in chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, starting in, oh wait, we're going to go one more place after this, sorry. Hebrews 11, verse 32. And what more should I say? For the time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who through trust conquers kingdoms, enforce righteousness, obtain promises, shut the mouths of lions, quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became strong in war, put to flight foreign armies. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Man, what a good thing. The promises of God, right? But others were tortured, not accepting their release <clears throat> in order to obtain a better resurrection. God must have told them, you have to go through this, but I will reward you in eternity. <laughs> and others experienced mockings and floggings and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were murdered with the sword. They went around in sheepskins, in goatskins, because they couldn't afford cotton, okay? They just, whatever skin they could throw on to cover themselves up, being destitute, afflicted, mistreated. Of whom the world was not worthy. Mm.
wandering in deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. Man, I've never suffered like that. I've never had kingdoms come upon me. I've been reading Jeremiah. What a, a man. He lived his whole life basically being mistreated by just about everybody he met. And all those, though having obtained a good testimony because of their trust, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect apart from us. If we're going to suffer, they don't get something we don't get, <laughs> and they don't get something we do. They get because of what we're going through with Christ, they're going to get this resurrection because through Christ came the resurrection. And this is, I never saw what my life meant when I saw these people. I was, it was like they were other people. <laughs> I didn't connect to them. I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's proof texting. That's taking verses out of context and using those to prove my doctrine. The fact is the Lord may ask me to suffer in order to save someone or for whatever other purpose he might have. And I have to decide whether I'm willing to do that or not. And you do too. Let's close in 1 Timothy. There are Christians all around the world that are suffering, that are being beaten, raped, killed. It, it's horrible. And in America, we talk about how rich we're going to be. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with being rich. Okay, not a, That's not a sin, but... One day we may face severe persecution here. It's coming. You can hear it in the political rhetoric coming from unbelievers. They don't like us. They think we're fools. They think that we should agree with them that murdering babies is okay. And that we are bad for telling them they can't kill babies. I mean, think about the insanity of that. <laughs> 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 5. I'm sorry, verse 3. No, sorry. Well, yeah, let's start in verse 3. Sorry, I wrote the wrong note here. My bad. If anyone teaches a different doctrine... And does not agree with sound words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the godly doctrine, he is puffed up, knowing nothing, and has a morbid interest in questions and disputes about words. From this only comes envy, strife, defaming speech, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are corrupted in mind and robbed of the truth, assuming that godliness is a way of gain. Well, oh, this is how you get rich, by believing in Jesus and just sending me that $100 every month. I the Lord will bless you with rain of money. Money will just rain through your air conditioning vents. <laughs> Godliness is not a way of gain. There is wisdom literature that teaches you how to make money, okay? And that's not an evil thing. But godliness in and of itself is not a way to get rich. Verse 6, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, neither are we able to carry anything out. But if we have food and covering, we will be content with that. But those who are determined to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and many senseless and hurtful desires that plunge people into destruction and ruin. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, which some, reaching out for it, have been led astray from the faith and have 
pierce themselves through with many sorrows. So this is an admonition about the love of money, that where that's the goal of our life, okay? Nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with being a, a successful businessman. In fact, God wants that, okay? We just don't want that to be the driving force of our life. Godliness, whatever God asks us to do, that's what we want. Verse 11, but you, O man, flee these men of God, flee these things and diligently pursue righteousness, godliness, trust, love, endurance, one of the words from Romans 5, and meekness. Fight the good fight for the faith. Lay hold on the life in the age to come to which you were called and confessed the good confession in the sight of many witnesses. This is our life's work, to lay hold on eternal life and to help others, no matter what we have to endure. And that if God asks you to endure hardship, he's got a good reason. And we need to trust him and boast when we have to go through them. Amen? So anybody got feedback on Andy's teaching? It hit me in an interesting way because um, it's been about seven years since I got... Um, kind of boosted, you know, away from my marriage relationship. And that um, for the, for that time, you know, there was a lot of, um, you know, just restarting and different things that I did. And I didn't spend a lot of time, you know, looking back or thinking about it. And only in the last couple of months have I actually, you know, gotten that far on the to-do list that, I've, you know, started to make that a priority to take a look at that and that, um, and that I started to realize that although lots of bad things came in my direction, that I wasn't like 100% doing exactly what Jesus was asking me to do. And that it kind of doesn't matter what the whole world says or done does if I'm not doing exactly what Jesus says to do then I'm a little at fault too, you know? <laughs> and so I've been kind of convicted, you know, in my heart about that. And I'm kind of looking at myself, you know, in a different way that way. And I think it's really, really good. I, you know, I pray so many times for, you know, God to make me humble and put me on my knees and, you know, get me to, uh, you know, really, really hear you know, and that you got to be careful when you pray that prayer because you might not always want to hear <laughs> what comes back. But um, yeah, I think it is kind of an answer to a prayer. And I think that it is, you know, a little bit tough, but a little bit good. And I think that, you know, I expect to see some growing come out of that. But I, um, yeah, I, hearing this teaching you know, really kind of blended and reinforced some of the other things that I've been, you know, books I've been reading and things I've been thinking about and going through. So thanks, Andy. Um, I have something to say. About it. Um, one thing that I don't really agree with is um, I don't always think it's God's plan that we suffer. I think that we live in a fallen world and there's a devil and there's a lot of sinful people and we're sinful, but I agree. Sometimes it might be his plan that we suffer, but I think there are some things that we go through that God really would not want us to go through. Absolutely. And if, if I came across as saying we're always supposed to suffer, that's not what I meant. I just, what I'm saying is that sometimes God might ask you to go through something and it, and it, so it, I'm actually kind of saying the opposite is that 
it's not always going to be good. That's really all I'm saying. And, and, and that I had been convinced that if I believed in Jesus, everything was always going to be good. But Susan, you're absolutely right. There are evil people that will do bad stuff to us and God will intervene. And we have a right to pray and ask for that. Okay. Susan, I do want to say, I recommend, this is actually a three part series that uh, mm -hmm. Andy on and you can actually find the videos on um, YouTube I, I know they post the videos so I recommend going back and listening through the first you know the other um, parts to the series yeah. there's a lot more yeah and I think you came in halfway through too on this teaching too so it, it's more there's more to it you know what I mean that you might be missing uh, but yeah, he, Andy did start out I, I agree with Melinda that um, you missed a little bit in the beginning and he did point out like sometimes it's just genetics that cause you to have health issues or whatever the case might be it's not always you know God that brings the, the suffering sometimes it's just some you know twisted thing that the adversary did whenever and it's flowing through the chain or whatever the case might be may have nothing to do with you. And that sometimes it's, you know, bad decisions that we make. He started out by talking about like, if you drink too much and you've got a hangover, that isn't God's fault, you know, type of example. So there, there are cases where it has, you know, nothing to do with God, but that there are times that nobody's going to talk to that woman in that coffee shop unless you muscle up and walk over and talk to her. And even if she calls you some name for disturbing her from what she's doing, that she might have really needed to hear those words that day. And that, you know, you took the abuse and you did it because you were walking by the spirit. That is what I think Andy's talking about. Okay, I just I just heard at the end, and I apologize. I just heard that you said sometimes God wants, or it's God's plan for us to suffer, and so I just didn't. Yeah, no, no oh, reason to apologize, right. Susan. That was a good that was a good question and a good comment. But uh, and so and did did I did I clarify it? And did what uh, Melinda and and uh, Michelle say? Did that? Yeah, clarify? yeah, yeah. I think, I think yeah. the point. For this is my two cents on. I think the point that Susan is raising is a very, very, very critical point in understanding suffering. Uh, because to me, the key is in, um, what book is this was Andy in? In 1 Peter chapter 4, the key verses in verse 19, it says, So then, let those who suffer in accordance with the will of God entrust their, uh, or entrust their souls to, faith, to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. So in that whole passage there, the point is, if you're doing the will of God and you have suffering, then, you know, that's different than if you're just living your normal life and you get cancer or you have a car wreck or something like that. That's different. And that's what, like Michelle was alluding to, we have, you know, the original sinner was Lucifer and then the second sinner was Adam, and then we have a fallen, exist, fallen world because of that, and we have genetic issues, we have accidents, we have attacks by the adversary, we have all of these things which can cause suffering, which to me is in a different category than suffering in accordance with the will of God when we're doing the will of God. And Andy's point of sometimes God wants you to do something and you'll have to endure suffering to get there. But to me, God's will is not for you to suffer. It's God's will for you to get there. It's God's will for you to help this person. It's God's will for you to have this ministry. It's God's will for you to go up to a person that you were afraid to go up to. You So yeah, you're suffering, but that's God didn't want you to suffer. He would like for you to be able to do that without suffering, I believe. Anyway, I've certainly must to learn about this. Yeah, that's and, exactly what I mean. And when, when, when Andy was suffering in his accident that he had, and you could probably teach me a lot on that, Andy, because I haven't had to suffer to that degree, but it wasn't God's will for Andy to suffer, right? There's many, many passages 
that it's God's will that you be healthy, that God's will for you to be healed. But there are circumstances where that's not available until the second coming. So, and it's really important because there's so many Christians. To me, this is one of the biggest fallacies of, of modern Christianity is that people are suffering, like from cancer, and they go, well, it must be God's will that I suffer for this. And, and they get mad at God, and they get upset, or you know, somebody loses a family member in a car accident. Well, it must have been God's will for me to endure this pain to teach me some lesson. I just don't believe that. You know, I believe that it's always God's will for us to find ways of enduring the suffering and for us to be healthy and us to be well. And that those categories of suffering to me are a little bit different than uh, suffering of the body of Christ, for instance, for spreading the word. I mean, there are millions of Christians now suffering because of their faith. You know, I just had some statistic that I put on my Facebook page about last year there were 5,000 Christians killed because of their faith. Year before that was 4,000. Year before that was 7,000. And that's not to mention all of the people put in prison and beaten and, and all of those other things. Those are the sufferings that, to me, that, that verse after verse after verse that Andy was covering today is talking about. So you have you have your suffering because of your work and because of your faith and those kind of things. And then there's individual suffering from pain and health issues and and the disabilities and things that happen to you and stuff. Anyway, that's my that's my two cents on that because that's one of to me one of the critical things that that people get messed up who are you know not taught properly. That's not two cents, Doug. That's fifty dollars, man. That, that that you nailed it. That was. You're, you've been listening. <laughs> and Can I and jump in? What's that? Can I jump in? Yeah, hang on. Let me say one thing real quick. Uh, and Susan, just uh, if you'll remember that the, the whole gist of this, these three teachings was to juxtapose suffering against the prosperity gospel, that everything will be peachy keen in this life if you love Jesus. And that's just not always true. So... Uh, great question, Susan. I, I'm not, I wasn't insulted or anything. Now, I want to, if you look at the history of the Christian church, you will see that we as a body of believers have been wrestling with this, that the apostles suffered greatly. And then the Christian church for the next hundred years or so, I'm not exactly sure on the dates and stuff, they suffered greatly. They were fed to the lions, they were brutalized. I mean, and then somebody got the idea, you know what, let's fight back. And so we started wars and the Catholic Church started the Crusades, you know, and, and th there were wars all over Europe and Christians were deeply involved in them and they were like fighting back. It's like, wait a minute, God doesn't want us to suffer here. And so I, and I have no doubt in my mind that God and, and the Lord Jesus did inspire Christians just say, okay, enough is enough, and we're going to push back on that. And then America, we, our nation, we have fought wars to, to protect people and protect the, uh, from evil, you know? And, and I, I have no doubt that God has been inspiring people to fight back and to say, no, we're not going to suffer that. So, yes, I'm not saying that we are always supposed to suffer and that life as a Christian is supposed to be suffering. So, but, there's, but there is a, a, a balance in there, and that's why we have to be in union with Christ so that we know in my personal life, am I supposed to go through something here or am I supposed to fight back? Am I supposed to say, no, I'm not going to go through that? So, go ahead, Gabe. So Andy, throughout the last three weeks, you've made some some profound points that have really helped me. Um, and I kind of just want to share these with the group. So the analogy that you used multiple times is about an athlete, right? Comparing these things to athletics, I think it's a good comparison. So 
one of the things that you said, I think it was the first week, maybe it was the second week, I think it was the first week, is that obedient, Christ's obedience was made perfect through his suffering. And, uh, you know, I tried to put that on myself. I tried to think about what that meant. So when you compare it to an athlete, their, their goal is athleticism. Their goal is to be a good athlete and be successful in their sport. The way that they get there, the way that they become that perfect athlete is through endurance or through suffering, through the pain of going to the gym and exercising and doing all that stuff. Our goal as Christians is to be obedient, to be a good servant. So, and then today you made the point that it doesn't, when you think about God as a father figure and how you as a father would tell your kids, you know, I don't care if you don't want to clean up your room, you're going to do it. And that being a comparison to uh, putting them through suffering, you know, to do the right thing, to get them to where they're supposed to be. When you combine those two ideas together, all of a sudden, uh, it starts to make sense why the Old Testament says that because Israel was disobedient, God put them in Babylonian exile. Um, and the only reason that that came to my mind is because that's where I am in reading the Old Testament. But because of the suffering that they went through being slaves, when you read Nehemiah and you see the repentance that was in their heart, all of a sudden it starts to make sense because they went through something and they came out of it with a repentant heart, which is where God wanted them to be the whole time. So, you know, sometimes there's things that we read, especially in the Old Testament, where it goes, why would God put this curse? Or why would God do this apparently mean thing? And oftentimes the fruits of it are, well, God, Israel, for at least for a moment, closer to where they want it to be. So I guess those two points, when you combine them together that you shared over the last three weeks, um, they really helped me understand some of the things that I've been reading lately. So thank you. Yeah, great, great points. And it's, so, you know, yeah, go ahead, Doug. Sorry. I was just gonna say, so David helped me understand this a little bit. So I would, by just my understanding of things, disagree with your point that God put them in exile. That I, I would rather think that they became in exile because of their lack of obedience. And so, which is a distinction. You know, it's like when, when uh, God gave the Mosaic Covenant, right? It's like, he, these are the blessings and these are the curses. If you obey and you do all of these things, you'll be blessed. If you don't do all these things, you'll be cursed. And so curse, cur and if you look at it to me like this way, what is, uh, what is darkness? It's the absence of light. And so, Curses comes from the absence of obedience and the absence of a following God. And so to me, it's, the, it's, it's not that God causes the cursing, although he created the rules. It's the lack of obedience which results in cursing, which is, if you can, if, if I can make that distinction, it's clear in my head, but I don't know that I've made it clear. <laughs> You know, Doug, I see what, I, I know what you're saying, right, in the sense that because God did not provide a blessing, it's as if he passively allowed a curse to be fulfilled. Um, but, and I can see why we would say that, right? Oftentimes we struggle on whether or not something is actually the idiom of permission. But right. the narrator of Chronicles, like the, the chronicler, the person who wrote Kings, and then if Ezra is the one who wrote Ezra and Nehemiah, they all do not hesitate to say that it is Yahweh who put Israel in exile. So regardless, we can go back and forth on the semantics of it, but I think the point is still there, right? Israel went through suffering and the outcome was that, you know, they got better. And think about what it takes to control, for lack of a better word, a whole nation of people, okay? And it's one of the reasons that the Lord has given us each the Holy Spirit so that he can work with us individually. As part of a body of believers, he works with us, but we are responsible individually. Like, let's say you, you were a, 
somebody living in one of the tribes in Israel. And the priests and the king are worshiping Baal. Well, you're not worshiping Baal. You're not burning your children at the fire, right? But all of a sudden you get yanked and taken to Babylon, okay? It is why God has worked through all of this to get to Christ. And he is protecting Israel from devilish forces. And so, and, and I think when we see God's big video screen and he shows us the movies of all this stuff, right, in the great hereafter, that we'll understand why he did that or why he allowed it to happen, as, as you're suggesting. That something was going on and that Babylon was actually protecting them, okay? It looked bad to them, but had they not gone to Babylon, maybe worse things would have happened to them. Maybe hordes of other nations would have come in and wiped out Israel completely, and then there would be no Messiah as promised, okay? And, and so that, that Babylon protected them, even though they didn't like living there, they were in a nation that protected, like right now, the United States, there's a lot of ungodly laws in this country, but we have a mighty military that protects us, and we're able to speak the word very freely in this country, whereas we're not other places. So sometimes God uses ungodly arrangements to protect his people because those ungodly people actually have the right idea about a particular thing in this day and time. Does that make sense, Doug? That, that it was, sure, it was punishment in a certain regard that they, that they had to leave their homeland, but something good came out of Babylon. And they ended up going back and rebuilding the temple, the Nehemiah stuff. Uh, so this is, di what I like about this subject is that you can begin with, with this understanding to, to really start to see some other things in the scriptures and, and, and figure these out in your own personal study and your private prayer life and your relationship with Jesus. I wanted to just um, tell you, I really appreciated these, um, this series that you did um, uh, on this and, um, one thing that kind of stood out to me, I guess, is um, just practicing endurance, practicing righteousness, you know, despite what's, whatever it is, is coming your way. Um, and that's the um, kind of key thing is it's easy to kind of feel like you're drowning when things are going bad and things are and just like, oh, poor me, or, you know, I mean, there's so much that can happen in life, and, and it can be really hard, and I think just to practice endurance, practice righteousness, keep keeping up the good faith, um, and uh, many of the verses that you, that you read, it was just really focused on, it's up to you to stand up and do the right thing, no matter what's coming your way. And so, um, and sometimes that can be a really difficult thing, but uh, I, I guess that's something that, you know, because many things will come your way. We're living a life in, in perfect place. And so lots of bad things are going to happen and good things are going to happen. And in both, whether it's good or bad, what are you doing? What is it that you're doing to further God's kingdom, to live righteously, to be closer to God and walk in the faith? those are the important things to, to focus on. And so anyway, that's kind of what stood out to me. I appreciate, um, I appreciate what you were telling us and pointing out in scripture. Yeah, Andy, I think for me, the overarching question that you've prompted in my heart is, am I actually ready to have the conversation with God to tell him that, yep, I'll suffer. Yep, I'm ready to deal with it. Tell me what to do, even if it involves me suffering. Um, and I, I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm ready to have that conversation. So thank you for at least putting it on my heart. Don, 
Donna Weedman, you've been so quiet, and I have never <laughs> seen you quiet in my whole time hanging with you. <laughs> Michelle, I, it's, when Andy was teaching, what I was thinking of is that the suffering of this present world is nothing compared to the glory that is going to be bestowed upon us. That walk, it's, I mean, it is astounding what God has given us and what we, he has placed within us so that we can walk. And we're here now in this time and place in history because God placed us here. And it is flipping amazing all that we have to work with. And God backs us up because he's our father. It's amazing. It really is. It was a wonderful teaching, Andy, because it just shows that God has fought for us all along. And that's why Jesus Christ, his son, died for us. So that we could be here, he called us out to do this, and we can do it.